And thank you, Okta, for being here and for having me at this conference this year. And my introduction to this topic, it really comes through my research on Wyoming and this one woman, Grace Raymond Hebert, that she's at the, at the center of all of my research in Wyoming. And she was at the beginning of the efforts to mark the historic trails throughout that state. And in 1920, she put together a book of all of their efforts to do that work. And in that book, she described this large granite monument that was placed on the Nebraska-Wyoming border. And reading her description of this monument and its dedication, I thought, well, there has to be a story here. And so I had a lot of fun researching this. I was able to go out on the trail a couple of different times looking for this monument and actually finding it. And I was also able to spend some time in Lincoln in the archive at, the, at History Nebraska going through and trying to figure out what was the story of marking the trails through Nebraska. Like most of the stories of marking the trails, it really starts with Ezra Meeker, that he was such an inspiration when he traveled across the country in 1906. And here in Okta, we are very familiar with Ezra Meeker. I really do encourage anybody who is interested in learning more about him to pick up Dennis Larson's excellent series that he has written several books. Um, each book focuses on a different portion of Ezra Meeker's life. And he's an awesome historian. It's an excellent series. I encourage everybody to check that out and read that. Ezra Meeker, when he came into Nebraska in 1906, he was seeing a much different trail. He was traveling from west to east. He had just come out of Wyoming, and Wyoming, it was rangeland. He was traveling the trail, and he could still see definite swales and the land almost untouched as it was in the 1850s when he first traveled the trail. It's a lot different once he's on the trail in 1906 in Nebraska. He said, from Fort Laramie onward into western Nebraska, we passed through a succession of thriving cities. The Platte has been turned to splendid service through the process of irrigation. Great canals lead its life-giving waters out to the thirsty plains that now blossom as the roses. Rich fields of grain and hay and beets cover the valley. Great sugar factories, sugar beet factories, railroads, business blocks, and fine homes tell of the prosperity that has leaped out of the parched plains we once traveled across. And he puts up these pictures of bridges and the sugar beet factories and the cornfields in Nebraska, that a lot of this trail has been plowed over and cities have raised up in its place. Ezra Meeker, he, he doesn't place any monuments in 1906 in Nebraska. He does have some really encouraging results in Grand Island. They agree that they're going to be putting up a monument, but they want to wait a year so it coincides with the founding of the city. And he has definitely planted the seed and that the inspiration has been sown in Nebraska. But he was a little bit preoccupied to be putting up his own monuments. It's in Nebraska that his beloved oxen, Twist, dies. He, Twist was a really reliable animal who always took the lead and took the brunt of the work. He was left with Dandy, who was an oxen that would try and shirk hard duty if he could, not the most re reliable of animals. And he thought, well, I saw herds of cattle moving wagons down the road in 1850. Surely I can buy a couple of cattle. Uh, the cows absolutely do not, re they refuse to move. They are as stubborn as mules. And he finally, by the time he makes it into Lincoln, he's finally able to um, purchase Dave. And Dave and Dandy are his oxen for the rest of his trip. So he, he was a little preoccupied with his oxen in Nebraska to be placing those monuments. But he did really inspire the state that in 1911, the legislature, they pass a appropriation of $2,000 creating the Oregon Trail Memorial Commission in Nebraska. And this Oregon Trail Memorial Commission, they say that they want to have the state surveyor sit on it, as well as the state regent for the Daughters of the American Revolution. 
I think it's interesting that they're already pulling in this patriotic organization that is a volunteer organization and they are not associated with the state of Nebraska. And they also want the secretary of the Nebraska State Historical Society. Now, the Nebraska State Historical Society from its beginning has been part of the state government. So they've got two state government guys there and a woman coming in who is from the more volunteer side of things, the, um, the private side of it. Sitting on that commission, we have Robert Harvey. He serves as president of the Oregon Trail Commission. And Robert Harvey, he was the state surveyor in Nebraska. He's a really interesting person who came to the state in, the, in 1869. Now, if you were here and you saw Brian Croft talk and share all of those great, interesting maps, I think that that um, Silas Chapman map, I also really liked that map. It just showed the eastern side of the state, only what was surveyed in 1869. And um, if you listen to the talk right before I started, Brock Anderson talking about those conflicts that were happening in western Nebraska, northwestern Nebraska in the late 60s, early 70s. All of these conflicts with the Native Americans are happening right when Robert Harvey is out here and he is surveying Nebraska and surveying what's going to become the future state of Nebraska. He was born in Ohio but raised in Indiana in 1844 and he served in Company D, the 74th Indiana Volunteer Infantry, and beginning in August 1862 when he was 18 years old, fighting in the Civil War. It's after the Civil War that he goes on to get his education and become a surveyor at the University of Michigan. And then in 1869, the first job that he takes is coming to Nebraska, and he fall, falls in love with Nebraska and really falls in love with the work of surveying. He becomes the absolute expert on the state and where things are located. He is there very early, 1869. He continues this work of marking the trails through his entire life. The Oregon Trail Commission in Nebraska, it's fairly short-lived. It only lasted from 1911 until they ran out of their money on April 1st, 1913. And then the legislature, they tried to approve another $2,000, but the governor vetoed it. And so they try and wrap up the rest of the work that they are, are doing. It takes them several more years to wrap up that work. And people like Robert Harvey, he carries that on into the next iteration of the Nebraska Memorial Commission. So it has a more broad um, perspective of where, where are they going to be marking that. Their mission is a little bit broader than that Oregon Trail Memorial Commission. And his last days, he, he got to be very sick. He had a sickness for about a week. And he called in the historical society people so he can start telling them where he wants all of his things to go and where he wants his latest book. He's working on a book to publish all of his surveys and his history of the Oregon Trail through Nebraska. I want to read a little bit from his obituary written by somebody from that State Historical Society. He said, the memory of Mr. Harvey is forever blended with the memories of several summers spent with him upon the Oregon Trail in Nebraska. Tracing the trails from section line, marking the points where monuments should be placed, surveying and pl plotting carefully the location of these monuments by the government corners of the land, making field notes of old Indian fights to accompany the illustrations, camping out under the open sky, and talking of pioneer days gone by. These were part of the experience of the summers upon the Oregon Trail with Robert Harvey. As he calls the historical society to them, he prepares a message to be sent out to everyone who is involved with the society, all of the staff members, and everyone who sits on the board. And this is his last message. He said, when the board meets again, I will not be there. But I believe the historical society has great work to do, and I want to see a generous state afford it the means for its work. So he's a big believer in the state of Nebraska funding and supporting this work of marking the historic trails. And he's serving as president of that commission. 
He has a letter book of over 500 different letters that he sent trying to complete this work. And, but for the most part, he is the person who is actually going out on the trail and picking out the location for these monuments to go. And he cares very deeply that it is in the precise exact location where the trail was. And he um, chooses the location of the 55 markers that that Oregon Trail Memorial Commission is able to place. Also sitting on that board is the Secretary of the Historical Society. This man, his name is Clarence S. Payne, and he serves as the secretary to this Oregon Trail Commission. Clarence Payne, he was born in 1867 in Minnesota in a very prominent Minnesotan family. In fact, he dies just a couple weeks after his father passes away in Minnesota, and they ship him back to Minnesota to be buried with his family, that there's a very prominent family there. He moved to Nebraska in 1897 to help the publish Morton's History of Nebraska. He had been involved in publishing several other state histories before he moved to Nebraska, but Nebraska is really the state that captures his heart and his imagination. He starts collecting artifacts and different things, and soon the Historical Society, they say, we want you to be sitting on our board, we want you to be serving as our secretary, and they start looping him into these leadership roles. And by January 1907, he's serving as the secretary to that board. He also served as the secretary and treasurer to the Mississippi Valley Historical Society, and he also is part of the Nebraska Sons of the American Revolution, which is sort of an interesting role here. I think Clarence Payne, he is remembered as being a very business-like man, that even though he was interested in the scholarship of it, that he could get things done in a business-like manner. He does a good job of making sure that everyone feels as though they're being listened to, even though he might not be following exactly what they should be doing, or he's going and making his own executive decisions and then having to convince people after the fact that, hey, this was the right thing to do. Um, he sort of sh shirks a little bit of responsibility when he's writing those letters, saying, now, I wasn't the one who was doing this, even though we have some other letters saying, well, yes, you were, sir. So he's got an interesting way of trying to make everybody happy in a situation. And serving as the vice president to the Oregon Trail Commission uh, were several different women. The Daughters of the American Revolution, they had several different state regents who served during this period. One woman who takes on a bulk of the work, in particular the story that we're looking at today, that monument on the Nebraska-Wyoming border, is going to be this woman, Charlotte Gove Norton. She, also, or she mostly went by the name Lottie. So Lottie Norton, she is um, a really interesting woman. She is born in Wisconsin in 1859 and grows up in Minnesota. And it's there where she meets her husband in 1879 is when they're married. It's unclear when exactly she moved to Nebraska, but by the time she's having her third son, she and her husband have moved to Nebraska. He was a banker and he had several um, banking interests. They moved to Kearney, Nebraska is where they own their home. And her third son, he's born in Kearney in 1893. Oliver Gove Norton, he's her only son who lives to adulthood, that her first son, he dies at the age of eight, and her second son, he dies when he's only four months old. So her third and her last child that she has, he lives um, into his adulthood, and he eventually starts working over in Germany for General Motors. Her husband, he passes away in 1896. So there she is with a three-year-old baby in Nebraska. And what is she going to do? I, I was very curious to try and figure out what she was doing financially. I found her on a, on a census in 1900. And her occupation, all she has written down is capitalist. <laughs> I don't know exactly what she was doing, but she was making it work. And, 
she was involved in several different organizations, um, a lot of patriotic organizations that are linked to her genealogy that Colonial Dames, the Daughters of the American Revolution. She's the first Vice President of the U.S. Daughters of the War of 1812. She also appears to be somewhat of an author that she is writing for newspapers and magazines. She is also a member of the League of American Pen Women. So she's part of this group of women that is saying we are writing the story that it's not just men of letters, that there's women of letters too. And she also sits on the International Arbitrarian Commission, which is sort of like an international chamber of commerce. That group is still around today. And during her time, she was the only woman sitting on the um, Kearney Commercial Club in Kearney, Nebraska. So she was a businesswoman with her business interests and definitely taking charge of her life after her husband's death in 1896. She lives on until um, her death in 1936. She stays in Kearney, Nebraska her entire life. In 1911, they were given that um, commission and on April 7th, 1911 is when that appropriation was signed into law and they held their first meeting April 10th, 1911. They were lickety split on the ball getting together and organizing how are they going to get this done. And some of the work that they start with, they're getting bids from different companies as to what these monuments and markers are going to look, look at. One of these bids is from a company that didn't get it, but I thought it was really interesting. They included pictures of the quarry where they are going to be getting their granite from. And the other, the blueprint, that is from the company that ended up winning the bid, the Kimball Brothers, ends up winning that bid. And they put out these blueprints of how to appropriately set that stone into place. Another aspect of getting that work started is actually making local connections with people. So these are the people that they credit as being the locals in Scotts Bluff County who helped them to find the locations to put out the bases. Um, Yorick Nichols and his wife Alice Nichols, they live in Henry, Nebraska, and they're the ones who pour the cement for the base on the Nebraska-Wyoming monument. That um, Je Grant Schumann, he is, or Shumway, he's somebody who's writing a lot about where that trail actually is in Scotts Bluff County. There's sort of some back and forth between the Wyoming folk and the Nebraska folk talking about is it north of the river, is it south of the river. They ultimately decide the Oregon Trail is on the south part of the river and that the trail that's on the North River, that is the Mormon and the California Trail. And so since they are marking the Oregon Trail specifically, they want to be marking south of the North Platte River. And it's that Grant Shumway who is helping them figure that out, that his family has been ranching in that region for a long time. It was decided pretty much immediately that they would want to be placing monuments on the border, the border with Kansas and the border with Wyoming. As I said, that first meeting of the commission was held April 10th the evening of April 10th, and on April 11th, the next morning, they're writing to the state librarian in Wyoming and telling her that they have this commission, they have this $2,000, and they want Wyoming to get involved and to partner with them in putting up this monument. This is Clarence Payne writing to Clara Bond, the Wyoming state librarian. He closes this letter saying, I think as Wyoming is a newer state and is not organized for this work, that we would be willing to pay the larger share of the expense of a monument on the state line, and both states could unite in its dedication, making an affair of no little importance. <laughs> now, he's very right that Wyoming was not as well organized as Nebraska, that we don't have an appropriation in Wyoming to do this work until 1913, so they're a couple years ahead of us. And then also, as far as these patriotic organizations go, the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Sons of the American Revolution, these are much smaller organizations in Wyoming compared to Nebraska. In Nebraska, we're talking about hundreds of members, and in Wyoming, we're talking about dozens of members. I think that 
uh, Leander Hills, he writes at one point that there's only 34 members in the Wyoming Sons of the American Revolution. So there is definitely not as much of an organization. The State Historical Society is a really foggy organization in 1911 in Wyoming. We don't have a state historian. Our state librarian, she is serving as de facto state historian as well in 1911. So she's wearing two hats. Um, Clara Bond, she basically writes to Clarence Payne and says, why don't you try the Daughters of the American Revolution? They're going to be your best bet here that the state doesn't really have much interest or ability to take part in this. And they finally do, they reach out to Emily Patton. She was the state regent of the Daughters of the American Revolution in Wyoming at the time. And she writes that, of course, they're very interested. Um, quite a bit of time has passed by now that we're talking April that they started to send these messages out and start to try and connect with Wyoming. And it's not until September 1911 that they finally have a contact who is going to try to be doing the work on the Wyoming side of things. Emily Patton, she was able to organize about $90, that $50 coming from the Sons of the American Revolution and $40 coming from the Daughters of the American Revolution in Wyoming. And she says that she'll make up that other 10 to make it an even 100. And essentially, that's what Wyoming is going to be able to contribute to this. Now Lottie, she is reaching out to the sons of the American Revolution in Nebraska. And during the same period in 1911, they also commit $50 to the cause. And the daughters in Nebraska, they're able to commit a full $100 to the cause. So Lottie, by the start of 1912, she has $250 to try and do something with it, to try and put these mon this monument up. And she is frustrated. By the time that November rolls around in 1912, nothing has been done on this monument yet. She says uh, she finally turns it over to Clarence Payne and asks if he could please do something about this. That the people in Wyoming, they, um, they're reliable that if we ask them to do something, they would, of course, get it done. But having the energy to get up and do it themselves, they're at a loss. They can't trust themselves to be able to actually get a monument put up and to have it be dedicated. And there were several complicating factors on the Wyoming side. For one, they, they're not set up to do this work. Nebraska has been taking bids and figuring out who can do this work the cheapest. They've been figuring out a lot of the logistics of actually getting this done. Wyoming, they're saying, well, we can try and get our state surveyor out there, but he's going to be taking his time. It'll be probably pretty slow before he comes out here. And should we be coming, should we get the granite from Colorado, that there's a place in Colorado where we can get this from? And finally, Lottie, she turns it over to Clarence Payne and she says, please just deal with this. And so Clarence Payne, he makes some executive decisions. The first executive decision that Lottie is writing him about in this letter, she is asking him, how should that inscription read on this stone? Should we have the Wyoming come first? Should we be polite to our neighbors and put Wyoming Nebraska border? Or should we, since we're doing the bulk of the work now, should we have Nebraska come first, Nebraska, Wyoming? And Clarence, he makes the executive decision in November 30th, 1912. This is his letter to the Kimball brothers. And it's basically his contract where he's writing out exactly what the inscription on that stone is going to be. So by November 30th, 1912, they have paid for and they have the stone chosen, the inscription set. Now they just need to figure out where is it going to go. And they believed at this point that there was a road on the Wyoming-Nebraska border. They sent Robert Harvey out to survey December 5th, 1912, and he discovered there is no road. The road is a, quarter, a third of a mile away. 
uh, from the state border. The state border on the Wyoming side, it's all private land. On the Nebraska side, it is a school farm land that they're growing alfalfa out there. And Robert Harvey, of course, he recommends putting that monument on the state border. It doesn't matter to him that nobody will ever be able to see it, that <laughs> there probably won't be a road ever built going there. Um, it matters that it is accurate. That is where the trail crosses the border. And that's what this monument is meant to um, demark, is the trail crossing the border. So setting it off onto the road, that's not going to be a very accurate placement. So he's a real big advocate for putting it on the road. Or not on the road, on the, on the border. And he also is contracting with Harvey, or sorry, um, that Yorick Nichols, who's living in Henry, Nebraska, Yorick Nichols to try and set that cement base of where that marker is going to go. They're figuring all of this stuff out on December 5th, 1912. But we have um, we have Clarence Payne writing to Emily Patton and telling her, before setting, uh, settling on the location of this monument or doing anything about its ded dedication, I shall await your pleasure. And he lays out that problem for her, that are we going to put it on the road? Are we going to put it on the border? At this point, the decision has almost basically already been made, that it's going to end the logistics have are, are already being figured out that they're going to be putting this on the border, but he's still making this effort to Wyoming. And I think that he sort of assumed in the back of his head that Wyoming, of course, would want that monument to be on the border as close to Wyoming as possible. He writes to um, Emily or Lottie Norton as well, telling her, oh, basically the same, that which way do you want this to go? Lottie, she, for her part, she wants it on the road. She wants this monument where people can actually see it. And so we start to see that conflict forming within the commission itself of what, what is the purpose of a monument? What is the purpose of a marker? I think that that's a question that we still have today when we're thinking about our efforts as an organization. Do we want to be putting up markers or monuments or information on the main roads and highways or the work that Randy Brown is doing. Randy Brown is cultivating these relationships with private landowners and putting up the octa markers where the actual trail is and where you can still see swales today. So what is the, that there's value in both of these. And now, of course, with the decision already being made, there is some miscommunication. That Lottie Norton, she immediately calls a meeting with the Sons of Wyoming, and they are deciding what, what do they want to do, where do they want this monument to go, and they basically agree that they want this monument to go on the road. <clears throat> Now, if it goes on the road, they want the inscription to read, Wyoming, Nebraska border. <laughs> After all, we are making a concession to Nebraska by putting it so far into the state that Wyoming really should come first. Leander Hills, he makes the argument that Robert Stewart, he wasn't traveling the trail east to west. He was traveling the trail west to east. So he came through Wyoming first. <laughs> Wyoming should come first on the monument. They also want that inscription to read where exactly the state line is, how many miles to the northwest it is from that spot on the road. Now, there's a big issue here. That monument has already been inscribed. <laughs> Clarence Payne, he did that on November 30th. So here we are, the end of December, December 24th, and the Wyoming folk are writing and saying, well, can we have the inscription read this? So we get a little bit of a panic from Clarence Payne. This is his letter panicking to um, Emily Patton saying, now I sent a, a copy of this letter to Leander Hills and I hope that you all are reading through this and that it makes sense to you. And then he also sends a letter to complain and commiserate to Lottie Norton 
saying, oh, if this does not clear things up, then I am ready to throw in the sponge like you did. <laughs> ready to wash his hands at these Wyoming folk. Now, I, I want you to imagine what it would be like to try and put something together like this conference without the ability to have Zoom meetings, without the ability to just pick up the phone and have a conversation, that all of these things are coming through letters and have days and days of delay in between them. And it's really hard to coordinate how these things are going to work. Now, when Clarence Payne wrote to the Wyoming people, he laid out some of the issues. And he said that back in November, he was told that a road existed on the border, that the monument was going on the road, so he already had the inscription made, and because it's going to face towards the north, and the trail went, towards the west, and people on the Oregon Trail walked through Nebraska first. Of course it says Nebraska, Wyoming on that monument. And he was also told that he was supposed to have this in place and dedicated by Christmas. And so he was trying to get all of this work done very quickly. And obviously, they had blown past their date for a dedication that he's writing these letters on December 24th, and the reply is coming on December 27th. So he's definitely missed the ability to have a dedication before Christmas. He recommends that they go forward with their plan to place it on the state border, and that perhaps they put up another marker on the road to say, hey, there's a monument over there in that field. <laughs> Keep an eye out for it. <laughs> Leander Hills the, from the Wyoming Sons of the American Revolution, he writes back, and he says that Wyoming has five conditions. First, it be placed on the state line. They had already pretty much done that. Second, that it faced towards the north, which was also Clarence Payne's excuse for why it says Nebraska, Wyoming on there. Third, that they do not change the inscription at all. So, so far, his Wyoming's requirements are pretty much what Clarence Payne has um, set forth. And then the fourth one I want to read to you, it, he said, that you secure from the proper authorities the right to place the monument on the school section in such a way that there will never be any question as to ownership. So the decision was made that that, board, that monument, instead of going on the state line and being partially in Nebraska or partially in Wyoming, that it would be bumped up right up against that line because of the private land in Wyoming. And they didn't want to deal with leasing the land and getting an agreement with that private owner and everything else. And since the land on the Nebraska side was that government-run school, it was believed that even if they sold that land to a private landowner, that that monument would remain the state property in perpetuity. And we have several letters of Clarence Payne writing that out, that this monument is always going to belong to the state of Nebraska and be part of the state of Nebraska's upkeep. The fifth requirement for Leander Hills was for them to place that another standard marker on the highway, that suggestion that uh, Clarence Payne had come up with. The solution of instead of choosing one or the other, why not do both? Put a monument on the road and a monument on the actual border. And with the monument actually in place that December 1912, they were able to move forward with planning their dedication. This is one of the first iterations of that planned dedication. As you can see, they were trying to get out there on December 20th. I can't imagine with travel the way that it is, trying choosing December as a month in this part of the country to travel in when roads are so unreliable, cars are, are so unreliable. Some people are still traveling by wagon and not by car yet in 1911. And so, sort of an unusual time. Fortunately, they were able to put that off until April 4th, 1911, or 1912. And this is 
mostly organized on the Wyoming side of things until the date is announced and sent out to all of the local people in Scotts Bluff County. And then they jump in on the organizing and they, they really make a big to-do out of the event. Clarence Payne, as a member of the, Sun, the Nebraska Sons of the American Revolution, he was tasked with inviting them to this dedication. Now, the Nebraska Sons, they donated $50 to the cause, and then they were left mostly out of it, that they didn't, they were not consulted when it comes to the inscription on the monument, where the monument is going to be placed, or when the dedication is going to be. He sends out these sort of flowery sort of language of like, I have the pleasure of inviting you to this um, event. This is the letter that he sends out to the Secretary of the Sons in Nebraska. And this is the letter that he sends out to the President of the Sons where he's actually asking them if, if he would mind delivering an address. Now this in invite is coming pretty close to the event that the event was on April 4th and he's sending this out on March 27th. So they have just about a week. <laughs> And as you can imagine, the sons felt a little slighted through the whole ordeal. There's only two mentions of this memorial in their minutes. The first one is when they decide to give $50 to the event. And then the second one is the Secretary Halstead writing that, hey, they were left out of all of the planning and everything to do with this monument. So the first letter that we have is coming from the president, and he makes a lot of excuses as to why he cannot be there, that there was a recent natural disaster in Omaha, and that he's very busy, and even with his regular business at hand, that he is too busy to attend. And he puts in a little bit of a slight there of, and the invitation just came so late that he obviously wouldn't be able to be there. The secretary, Halstead, Edwin Halstead, he gets a lot more down to brass tacks. And at the very end of his letter, he writes, you can appreciate my position as representing our honorable society and for feeling indignant that our society has been entirely omitted from any official action over this matter. And so the Nebraska sends, they Basically, they have given $50, they don't feel very good about it, and they refuse to go to the dedication. Clarence Payne, um, this is a little bit of what I was talking about with his personality here, that he was a fairly new member of the Sons of the American Revolution, and I'm joining them in February 1912. And at the start of this letter, he says something along the lines of, if I had my ability, I would have absolutely nothing to do with this monument on the Nebraska-Wyoming border, that I, I was merely doing what was asked of me by the Nebraska daughters of the American Revolution and the Wyoming daughters and sons of the American Revolution, and that if you have an issue with any of it, that you need to take it up with them because they're the ones who are making all of the decisions on this. He does come to their defense a little bit. He's at the end. He says, now, I believe there was good reason for their haste, but I'm not going to explain them that if they, if they want to give you an explanation, they can. There, were, there was some more miscommunication um, in planning this dedication that Yorick Nichols and his wife, Alice Nichols, they were initially told 2 o'clock but it was a very tentative time that was set of a, oh, the Wyoming people are really the ones who have to choose the time because they're the ones who are going to be traveling into the state. So we need to give them the leeway to be choosing this time. And Yorick Nichols, he said, two o'clock, two o'clock, puts it in the papers, makes all of the, all of the plans and logistics, planning on two o'clock, and then things from the Wyoming side start coming in, and the Wyoming papers start announcing it for 10 o'clock, and he writes to Clarence Payne. <laughs> so this letter that Clarence Payne is writing to Yorick Nichols, it's clear that Yorick has sent a copy of Clarence Payne's letter back to him and saying, see, you told me 2 o'clock. What are they saying 10 o'clock? 
And here is uh, Payne saying, oh, you are sorely mistaken. This is just a tentative time. Uh, it was not never set in stone, but I'll quickly telegraph the Leander Hills in Wyoming. And fortunately, I think that they did finally settle in on that 2 o'clock time. The dedication, it finally took place April 4th, 1913. The Nichols Hotel, they had a huge sign out front saying, Oregon Trail Rendezvous. And the description of this event, it was such a large event, I thought, wow, Henry, Nebraska must have had a lot more people living in it than it does today. And the closest that I could find in the census record to this event was in 1920, that they weren't on the census in 1910 yet, so very small community, but in 1920 they had one more person living there, 129 people living there compared to today, there's 128 people there. So very, very small community, but they put on a really large event. They had the band from Torrington come and play music, patriotic tunes. They also had the Boy Scouts from Scotts Bluff. The Boy Scouts from Scotts Bluff, they actually spent the night before out by a pioneer grave, Henry Hill, that's in the area. And some of the swales in that area, they spent the night up there. And then they came down into Henry and they escorted the entire procession, the two miles south of Henry, to the monument out in the middle of this field. The newspapers, they describe anywhere from 400 to 500 people. That's probably a little bit of an exaggeration looking at this picture. I calculated maybe 150, 200 people in this image here. Speeches were given, and after the speeches, after the big to-do, there was a party hosted by the Nichols at their hotel, a, a dance that was a riotous affair, is what Clarence Payne describes it as. Grace Hubert, the woman who I researched, she, was, she had come down with the flu and she was unable to make it to the dedication to deliver an address that she had prepared. And she, uh, Clarence Payne writes to her and says, oh yes, and I was feeling very sick afterwards. I had to pull off on my way home to Lincoln and he was throwing up. And I thought, well, that sounds more like a hangover than <laughs> <laughs> rather than a flu or anything. So quite a party at the Nichols Hotel. He writes to both Yorick and Alice Nichols and he says that if Henry Nebraska doesn't turn into a huge metro, metropolitan in Nebraska that it's because they didn't live long enough. <laughs> After the dedication, there was still some work to be done. Wouldn't you know it, they put that monument in so it was facing towards the south. So they had to fix it. They had to get Yorick out there and refix that base. They did end up flipping that so it faces towards the north. I've actually been out there and that is the way that it faces. And they also, by December 1913, they have that monument placed out on the road. Wyoming and Nebraska, they continue to collaborate and work together. That Wyoming, when we finally are able to get our Oregon Trail Commission established, we have Emily Patton writing to Clarence Payne and asking him, how much do the Kimball brothers cost? And how did you handle transportation on the railroad? In 1915, Grace Raymond Hebert finally makes it out to the monument. And you can see Clarence Payne writing her and asking her whether or not the people of Henry ever got that fence installed, that they were supposed to put up a fence around that monument. And judging from Grace Hebert's picture, no, they were unable to get that fence up there. Access to this monument is a really interesting subject. I was able to get close to this monument on Sunday with Randy Brown in the pre-trek trail. It was, I found out, thanks to Randy Brown, that there used to be a road next to the monument. So you used to be able to drive right up next to that monument. Today, I was able to find it with the thanks of a local from who was born in Scotts Bluff, grew up in Henry, lives in Henry, and he knew all about the gray monument on the road, that standard monument that they put there, but he had no clue about the large red granite monument that is just in that field there. 
And looking at this monument, you can see that it's just right off of the road. It's not paved like the state of Nebraska will sometimes pave those pull-offs or put up a sign saying, hey, there's a monument here. These 1912, these early monuments, they don't have that. I did stop in at Chimney Rock and spoke with Lauren out at Chimney Rock, a really knowledgeable about the trails and about the markers in Nebraska. And he told me that a lot of the roads have moved away from the monuments, but the monuments have stayed where the old road was. So a lot of these 1912, 1911 monuments have been forgotten about. And to actually go out to the monument today, it is a little bit different. The landowner, it is uh, the same family of landowners who own this property, but it is a new generation who is now maintaining the property. And this year, they decided instead of having a pathway where you could walk out to this monument, they planted it right in the middle of their cornfield. <laughs> So to go out there, it took the county road, um, walked over a huge berm, and tried my best not to step on their new crop. And I was very fortunate at the beginning of this year that the corn was just about waist high, so I was still able to go out and see it. Had to overshoot it a little bit and go to walk to their water pump, and then finally was able to cut back towards that monument. I don't know if I... You can sort of see walking through the corn there. And now we were unable to do this last Sunday, that the corn, by this point, it was over our heads. It was, you, there was no way for us to walk out and see the monument. Oh, yeah. No, oh no. And that, I'm holding my phone down low so you get the, the full effect of the corn. But <laughs> some interesting questions about what, what the role of our, our organization is today, I think, to be had. One of the things that the landowner said, he. <laughs> One of the things that the landowner said um, was that wouldn't it be great if we could move this monument to the, si the side of his field so it doesn't interfere his crops anymore. And I said, oh no. <laughs> I, I can just feel Robert Harvey rolling in his grave. But he wanted that monument on the state border where the trail actually crossed. He did all of those surveys to, cho to choose this location. You can see that this monument, it, has, it was sinking. Um, it has been lifted in 1987. They did a rededication on it. In the 2000s, it had that Pony Express marker put up. And you can see all of that rubble that's been put up to try and lift it out of that sinking sand. And I think that with this story, it leaves us with a lot of the issues that we, we are still facing as an organization today. How do we collaborate as different states? How, how do, as an organization that spans so many different states, how can we work together to accomplish our goals and not get on each other's nerves? <laughs> how, how can we work with the landowners to, and collaborate with the landowners to ensure that these monuments are accessible? And how can we work with the state and, of Nebraska in order to ensure that they they hold up their end of the bargain, that they're, bar that they're supposed to be maintaining these and providing access to these monuments. I, I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to dive into those questions and start this conversation with you all, and to be able to go out on the trail and see these monuments myself. Thank you.